is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Katie Weaver joins us for an education story. She tells us that some city schools are having trouble holding on to their minority teachers. After that, Ana Mateo is here with this week's Words and Their Stories. She tells us one way to talk about having a careful conversation. Then, Kelly Jean Kelly presents the next part in our series on America's Presidents. But first, here's John Russell. Sea ice in the Antarctic area fell to a record low this year. The drop is a result of rising temperatures worldwide. And there is no quick fix to make up for the damage, scientists said recently in a new study. Antarctica's minimum summer ice cover, which last year dropped below two million square kilometers for the first time since satellite monitoring began in 1978, fell further to a new low in February. The scientists' findings appeared in the publication Frontiers in Environmental Science. In a hoag of the University of Leeds in Britain was one of the study's co-writers. When speaking about the melting icebergs and shelves, she said, it's going to take decades, if not centuries, for these things to recover. There's no quick fix to replacing this ice. This year's sea ice minimum is 20% lower than the average over the last 40 years. The warming of Earth's surface, driven by the burning of fossil fuels, has made Antarctica more likely to suffer from extreme events and the effect is almost certain to get worse, the study said. Climate change will lead to increases in the size and frequency of heat waves, ice shelf collapses, and declines in sea ice, it said. The study drew on recent evidence from scientific studies of the Antarctic Ocean, atmosphere, cryosphere, and biosphere. Last year, an atmospheric river coming from Australia pushed heat and moisture into Antarctica. The result was temperatures up to 38.5 degrees Celsius above normal, the largest variance from the norm the world has ever experienced. Siegert described the temperature increase as absolutely astonishing. Siegert added that if the event had happened during the Antarctic summer, instead of winter, it would have caused melting on the surface of the East Antarctic ice sheet, which has so far been saved from melting. Siegert used the term fragile, meaning easily broken or damaged, to describe Antarctica. Antarctica is fragile as an environment, but extreme events test that fragility, he said. What we're deeply concerned about is the increase in intensity and frequency of extreme events and the influences that they have in other areas. I'm John Russell. States are reporting that teachers are leaving their jobs in growing numbers. In some cases, retirement is highest among teachers from minority groups. One reason is stress 
from burnout during the COVID-19 pandemic. Another reason, teachers say, is low pay. And another reason teachers give is what they call the introduction of politics in the classroom. But the stress can be worse in schools serving poor communities that have a lot of minority teachers. Rhonda Hicks is leaving her teaching job in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She said she loved teaching and loved her students. As a black woman, she took pride in being a role model for minority children. But growing demands from administrators over what and how to teach made it harder for her to work. When she retires, she will join a disproportionate number of Black and Hispanic teachers in her state who are quitting. I enjoy actually teaching. That part I've always enjoyed, said the 59-year-old Hicks. But it's the higher-ups. Do it this way or don't do it at all. That, she said, was stressful. Philadelphia has one of the highest percentages of blacks in any major U.S. city. But the number of black teachers has been falling. Twenty years ago, about one-third of teachers were black. Last fall, that percentage fell to below 23 percent. The Associated Press reports that about 80% of American public school teachers are white. White students, however, are not a majority in public schools. Having teachers who are the race of their students is important, researchers say. The idea is that teachers can provide students with role models who share their culture and life experience. Retirements could affect recent efforts to bring more Black and Hispanic teachers into public schools. New, inexperienced teachers are more likely to quit. Researchers say minority teachers often are affected disproportionately by layoffs. Ed Fuller is an education professor at Pennsylvania State University. In a report, he wrote that black teachers in Pennsylvania were over two times more likely to leave their jobs than white teachers after the 2021-2022 school year. The numbers for Hispanic teachers were similar. They're in more precarious teaching positions, meaning you're in a position with less resources and worse working conditions. So you're more likely to quit no matter who you are, Fuller said. States are reporting different rates of retirement for minority teachers, but Travis Bristol said minority retirement rates have been higher than rates for whites for 20 years. Bristol is an education professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He blamed federal policies from around 20 years ago that began leading to the closure of schools where students repeatedly had low test scores. In poor schools with large populations of Black and Hispanic children, teachers say they have more responsibilities. They also say they have fewer resources and more children who are troubled by poverty and violence. Chantal Simpson is a 36-year-old teacher in Texas who quit teaching after 11 years this spring. She said other minority teachers are leaving because of growing expectations from administrators. They believe we can handle more, Simpson said. 
So we get fitted with the children who are more challenging or have more requirements. It's crazy. That leaves teachers who deal with difficult children less time for the rest of their students who behave better, Simpson said. I'm Katie Weaver. Now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give definitions, notes on usage, and use them in conversations. Today, we talk about a piece of clothing, gloves. We wear gloves to protect our hands. When the weather is cold, we wear gloves to keep our hands warm. When we do difficult outdoor work, we might wear work gloves. And when we clean indoors, we might wear rubber gloves to protect our hands from chemicals. But when do we wear kid gloves? Kid gloves are made from the skin of a young goat, also called a kid. Kid leather is very soft, so kid gloves are perfect for holding objects such as silverware and art without leaving fingerprints. Years ago, many servants would wear kid gloves. But today we use the expression "kid gloves" to describe a way of dealing with certain people or situations. People who are sensitive require kid gloves, and situations that are complex and delicate often need the kid glove treatment. However. When we use kid gloves to talk about people, it is a little different than when we talk about situations. To treat something with kid gloves is to handle a situation carefully and with tact. When we do something tactfully, we do it in a thoughtful way. Tactful people. Deal with people and situations very well. They are diplomatic. Handling a situation with kid gloves is the opposite of being a bull in a china shop. If you are a bull in a china shop, you handle a situation very carelessly. We talked about this idiom on another words and their stories. Kid glove treatment shows special skill and sensitivity. People who need kid glove treatment might be very sensitive, meaning their feelings are easily hurt. Or they might be fussy and demanding. For example, really famous actors or pop stars might need the kid glove treatment. Now let's hear the idiom used in a conversation between two friends. What are you doing this weekend? An old friend is visiting me. We were best friends all through middle school and high school. That sounds fun. Well, I hope it will be. Why do you say hope? Well, she just went through a very nasty divorce from her high school sweetheart. She's still very sensitive about it, so I have to handle her with kid gloves and not talk about our high school days. Sounds like a little kid glove treatment is just what she needs, and you can talk about the future instead. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Anna Mateo.
I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. We just heard Ana Mateo talk about kid gloves, an English phrase that people use when they're discussing sensitive subjects. Ana joins us now. Ana, thanks for talking with us today. Thank you, Dan. Glad to be here. Uh, tell me, are you always careful with your words? Ana, I hate to admit that I am not. I have been known to put my foot in my mouth. I should be more careful. Perhaps I should buy a pair of real kid gloves to remind myself to choose my words more carefully. Well, Dan, I'm not sure that is absolutely necessary, uh, but you could remember this conversation next time you speak without thinking. That's true, Anna. I'd hate to be a bull in a china shop. Ah. I could just play this conversation every time I'm about to have a difficult discussion and just remind myself to take it easy. Can you remind our listeners where this expression comes from? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the idea comes from the fact that kid gloves are special gloves made from the skin of a baby goat. So they are very soft, the gloves and the baby goats. Uh, and the gloves are used when handling very costly objects, such as silver or artwork. So they protect, they protect the silver or artwork or valuable object. Hmm. I don't know if I really need to buy the kid gloves then. I don't have too many valuable things, but just keeping this conversation in mind will be helpful. Anna, our listeners already heard about one situation where they might want to practice the kid glove treatment. Can you think of another time someone might want to treat something with kid gloves? Sure. Um, so when we talk about people, we are talking about sensitive people. Those are the ones you need to treat with kid gloves, to handle with kid gloves. But a situation is a little different. Maybe, um, for example, a government official is meeting with another government official about a very delicate, sensitive subject. Both will need to use kid gloves to keep the situation from becoming worse. So they need to be diplomatic. That's right. I had a friend who used to tell me all the time to uh, to use diplomacy in my conversations. So that's a good example. I think we all can probably keep the kid glove treatment in mind when we're upset or worried. Anna, thanks for telling us about this phrase this week. Anytime, Dan. I hope it's helpful. Thank you. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about William McKinley. He took office in 1897 and was re-elected in 1900. He led the United States into the 20th century. One way to think of McKinley is as a transition president. In the 1800s, lawmakers were mostly concerned with how the country was growing in North America. But during McKinley's government, the U.S. looked beyond its borders. Congress declared war on Spain, the first time the U.S. had fought a European power since the War of 1812 against Britain. The U.S. also took control of overseas territories, annexed Hawaii, and tried to regulate the world's trade with China. Some historians say President McKinley himself wanted the U.S. to increase its international influence. Others argue that he was just answering the country's mood at the time. Either way, his presidency is often defined by the country's rise as an imperial power. Mm -hmm. 
McKinley was the sixth president to come from the state of Ohio. He was the seventh of eight children. Historians describe his childhood as loving and fun. His father owned a small iron factory. His mother raised her children to be honest and polite. McKinley was a hard-working student. He briefly attended Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, but he did not have the money to finish his education there. A few years after leaving that school, he volunteered for the Army on the side of the Union in the Civil War. He served under a man who would later become president himself, Rutherford B. Hayes. The two stayed close throughout their lives. After the war ended, McKinley studied law, became involved in Republican Party politics, married, and had two daughters. His wife, Ida, was an energetic, well-educated young woman from a wealthy family. For a while, she had worked in her father's bank. But Ida McKinley's health began to suffer. She was struck by seizures. Then her mother died. A few months later, her younger daughter died while still an infant. Ida McKinley clung to her older daughter, but the little girl soon developed a fever disease, and she died too. William and Ida McKinley were never the same. Ida McKinley remained sick her entire life. She spent most of her hours in a small rocking chair sewing. William McKinley paid great attention to her. He organized his schedule to spend time near her, even as his political success grew. In time, McKinley served in Congress and as the governor of Ohio. He was known as a likable person and a skilled politician. His Republican Party nominated him on the first ballot at their convention. A few months later, Voters elected McKinley into office in a landslide. He became the country's 25th president. When McKinley took office, the U.S. was just coming out of a severe economic depression. His government quickly approved a high protective tariff to help struggling workers. In general, his administration also permitted the growth of big business. But most of McKinley's attention as president was devoted to foreign policy. The main issue was Cuba. At that time, Spain controlled the island. Cubans revolted, and Spanish forces used violence and detainments to crush the rebellion. In the U.S., many Americans denounced the events in Cuba. They wanted McKinley and his government to intervene. At first, President McKinley was unwilling. He tried to use diplomacy. He even ordered a U.S. ship into Spanish waters near Havana to show his continued support of Spain. But the ship, called the Maine, exploded. Americans believed the Spanish were responsible. Relations between the two countries worsened fast. Spain declared war. The U.S. Congress answered in kind. For 100 days... U.S. and Spanish forces fought in Cuba and other areas under Spanish control. The war quickly turned in the Americans' favor. When the Spanish-American War ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1898, the U.S. took control of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines from Spain. Cuba was made independent. However, the U.S. continued to occupy the island for several more years. Not everyone approved of the actions of McKinley's government. 
Even some members of Congress warned against the U.S. becoming an imperial power. But a majority of voters approved of McKinley as a victorious commander-in-chief. They also noted that the U.S. economy was getting stronger. In 1900, McKinley won re-election. As it turned out, McKinley's second term in office was short. In September, only six months after his swearing-in, the president was receiving visitors at a fair in the city of Buffalo, New York. One of the visitors in line was a 28-year-old man named Leon Szolgosz. His family was from Poland, but he lived in the city of Detroit, Michigan. He had worked in a factory, but at the time was unemployed. He supported the idea of anarchy, no government at all. When McKinley reached to shake the young man's hand, Shulgosh shot the president twice in the stomach. Although injured, McKinley spoke to his guards. He told them not to hurt the shooter, and he expressed concern about how his wife would feel when she learned he had been shot. Quickly, McKinley was taken to a hospital. Doctors predicted that he would survive. And for a few days, McKinley seemed to improve. But the wound became infected, and eight days after the attack, McKinley died. The president's murderer did not say he was sorry for his act. He defended it, saying McKinley was an enemy of working people. Within a few weeks of the shooting, Shulgosh was tried, found guilty, and executed. Both the nation and the world mourned when McKinley died. He had been one of the country's most popular presidents in many years. He left behind the beginning of what some called an American empire. He also marked a change in the U.S. presidency. When he first took office in the 19th century, most presidents acted primarily as administrators. But President McKinley began to act in ways that are more like a modern president. He prepared remarks to give to the media. He traveled across the country speaking to voters. He used the power of his office to direct the armed forces. McKinley laid the groundwork, but he did not completely change the presidency. He left that to the even more famous man who followed him into the White House. After McKinley's death, his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, took office and truly brought the country into modern times. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. 